Okay, so thank you very much for coming. Let me introduce to you uh, Afarim Belisario. Uh, she obtained a PhD degree in mechanical, mechanical engineering, thank you, uh, from MIT, and a MBA in from international MIT. business from the MIT Sloan School of Management. And she was working uh, for several years in, in many countries, in many companies, some of, of them uh, really large companies such as analog devices and Intel. Uh, she created uh, her own company, Trans. Uh, Trans. Yes, that's Trans Strategy. You're doing well. Exactly. Very good. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't remember the name. Trans Strategy. A very nice, very nice name, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2006, and now from uh, well, it's in part of the of the staff of the TLO of the MIT, uh, working particularly in paid patents, uh, licensing of patents. So she's uh, an expert in, in this kind of things, and particularly also in, in, in interpre the entrepreneurial stuff or, or domain. Um, well, she believes that uh, in order to to obtain uh, impact, it is not necessary or it is not enough uh, to have uh, good ideas, even great ideas, but it is necessary at the same time to, to have the cap capacity to turn them into, into reality. And I think that in some sense this is the main difference between the MIT as a higher education and research institution and the most of the rest uh, uh, institutions all over the world. The, the capacity to, to turn the great ideas into reality. So thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, welcome to Santiago de Compostela. Welcome to this uh, research center. Uh, thank you very much for sharing with us your experience and your knowledge, not just in this uh, talk because she was uh, with us all the, the, the morning, and in fact, uh, she was visiting the center. She was uh, she uh, was with uh, part of the staff of the technology transfer office of this university and with some of uh, our spin up So thank you very much, and well, it's uh, your time and our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, one of the oldest universities in Europe. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a student of history, and uh, for me, 500 years of having an institute of higher education is definitely is a, is a wonderful thing. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm here to share some, some stories with you um, about my experience. Um, all my professional life from the time that I graduated from MIT to, to today, I've been involved with emerging technologies, bleeding edge, that's what we call them. Uh, is, that's a little, uh, is that, so, so bleeding edge technologies is my specialty. I deal with those. Uh, I deal with them as, uh, I dealt with them as technologist. I dealt with them as a uh, marketing person. I was, I worked for Intel Corporation and analog devices um, in strategic marketing and product marketing, all kinds of business development, uh, but always dealing with the latest and the greatest. Um, um, the company that I started with, uh, Trans Strategy, also dealt with commercializing technology because, as uh, you know, to create impact. Uh, as technologies, my my idea has always been that I want to create an impact. I want to make people's life better. Maybe in the process, I make money too. But what's what's important for all of us is to create an impact. Uh, a good friend of mine from uh, MIT Media Lab, uh, Professor, Professor Picard, Rose Picard, she said, you know, there's lots and lots of, um, you know, intelligent people who, like yourselves, are in the universities. You guys can work on any problem. You can solve any problem. But it is very important to hear that, okay, this problem that you're going to be solving is going to cure cancer, is going to uh, make life better, you know, make life uh, easier for people that you love and other people in the world. So for scientists, um, as well as for, you know, marketing people, it's important to create an impact. Small, large, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, that's what 
most of us as human beings like to do. So I just want to share with you some stories, some experiences. Feel free to ask questions and uh, we'll have a good chat and uh, hopefully we'll learn something from each other. Uh, we all have heard about the patents and intellectual property creating money. Um, you, these are some of the uh, last, you know, 2014's take, uh, technology IPOs. Uh, there are some, you know, buyouts and acquisitions. You know, there are companies with, um, I don't know, 30 patents were sold for $3 billion. So intellectual property, we all know that uh, uh, creates money, creates wealth. Um, in America, we measure the impact mostly with dollars. Um, you know, it could be different from different countries, but, but in America, you know, this, this is how we keep score. So as you can see, companies, you know, uh, entrepreneurial companies were either sold or went for an IPO for big numbers, 70 million, a billion, whatever, you know, in the in case of Alibaba, it's 22 billion. Uh, but it's not the patent that matters. Uh, it's, the, it's the patent that has become a, a product, a technical product that um, is, is important, that, that creates impact. One of the, uh, a couple of um, examples, is, again, I'm a storyteller. Um, most of the time, you know, even in the semiconductor industry, I ask people, Do you, have you ever heard of Julian Lilienfeld? Nobody has. Uh, in fact, the world would not have known about him had it not been that uh, when uh, that, that his patents was discovered by AT&T attorneys when they were patenting the uh, the, the famous transistor uh, patents uh, in 1940s and 50s. Uh, this Julian Lilienfeld was a very smart person. In 1920s, he was a German. Um, American, German, Canadian researcher, and he patented what we know and love today as a building block of transistors uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a particular architecture called field effect transistors. I don't know how many of you are in the electronics, but almost the, the majority of the CMOS uh, stuff that we use uses that, that building block. Now, the reality is that that was discovered in 1925 by Julian Lillenfeld and it was patented. Now, nobody knew about it. Nothing happened. Uh, again, in 1947, um, three researchers at a Bell Lab, uh, at and Bell Labs, reinvented the same thing. They didn't know about it. So they reinvented it. But what at and did, the Bell Lab did, you know, they created an ecosystem. They, they commercialized this technology rather than just invent it and get a patent. The patent, as I said, the, 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 uh, the original patents were discovered when they were doing a prior art search on AT&T patent. It ended up that uh, uh, the researchers did win the Nobel Prize in 1956, our digital economy. It's many trillions of dollars every year, whether or not it's a cell phone or a computer or whatever, most of our lives depend on what was commercialized, not what was discovered, but what was commercialized. Um, and you can uh, look at the history and see that um, people who worked for AT&T in that particular project ended up uh, creating a manufacturing, um, and Texas Instrument was born from that. You know, some people went out and created, uh, I don't know, Lucent. So many, many companies spun out of that commercialization effort by AT&T. But the, the value is, is the whole thing was not in the patents, which they couldn't get another patent because it was already prior art, but in the fact that AT&T made that real, made that possible. Uh, there also, we also know about companies that went bankrupt uh, with 6,000, 5,000, you know, Polaroid, and Kodak each had many, many, many patents. In fact, when I was uh, doing my, uh, when I was working as a consultant, I was involved in the dis dissolution of Polaroid patents. And, you know, lots and lots of patents about a lot of different things, none of them commercialized. So what's important, the, the, the morale of the story is that what's important is that you take the idea and make it happen. 
Some will happen, some won't, but it's important to make it happen. So, going from ideas to a product and impact requires a lot of different kinds of knowledge. Uh, we at universities normally deal with that first part of it. We have great creative ideas. We have some basic science uh, and engineering asset, which is combination of knowledge, um, uh, machines, uh, I don't know, tools, whatever. Uh, we can sometimes we create a validated concept. We, we prove it on the piece of paper. We get a patent on that. Uh, on the other hand, big companies or commercial companies have practical domain knowledge. They know what the customer wants. They know who the customer is. They know how, to, how much should it cost for them to sell and support and all kinds of the important things about the, uh, uh, the sales uh, and, and creating of an impact and you know, getting to a, a huge, big, big sales effort. Uh, in between, there is a gap. You know, most of the time, university, uh, you know, PhDs, very smart people, they may not speak the language of the business. So something or some entity must be devoted to taking that idea and making it happen as a, as a commercial product. One way to do it is, uh, and, and this is a dance. So you start with the technology here, and you know you say, okay, so this is what I want to make. Uh, you know, back in the days, if you look at uh, you know uh, an engineer from Raytheon discovered that wherever he goes to was a, a particular radar, he was working on radar, that's in 1945, um, uh, he, the, the candy bar melts in his, his pocket. He used to have a candy bar every day and this candy bar would melt. Um, many people would say this is just a coincidence. For him, uh, he did uh, a lot of studies, he found out that you can create heat with microwave and that was the nucleus of uh, microwave ovens that we have today. How many of you have microwave ovens? Almost everybody. So, so, but but the, the origin of the idea was an observation, scientific one, and he played with it in, back in the 1945, and then it, he, it took a while, to, so the first product was actually an uh, oven that was the size of a room for a submarine, because it was you know, creating so much heat that uh, you couldn't put it in a regular building. Uh, but it's a dance, so ma people made it better, better, smaller, cheaper, smaller, cheaper, faster, smaller, cheaper, faster. It's a dance. So you start with an idea, you start with some application in mind, and maybe you go around this, uh, this, uh, this loop multiple times until you get it right, until the product is now ready for the market. And it all depends on how far along uh, the idea you are, how close you are to the product. You may go once and you get a really good product. You may go 10 times. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Newton? Okay, no, Newton did the product. How many of you? Okay, this was a product. Okay, this was all the, this was the beginning of the tablet era. It was not ready for the, you know, for, for the, uh, for the show time, but People tried it, people brought it out, still going around and around until it became a tablet that most of us use today. So the idea is that this is a trial and error. Um, you get some input from the customer. The more and sooner you get, you find your customer, obviously it's better. Um, the, one of the, the other thing that we should know about it is that patent's just a piece of paper. If you want to transfer knowledge, you have to have a person. Like, let's say, for example, you have a patent about a chemical process that says this will work between 5 degrees centigrade and 100 degrees centigrade. But you as a researcher know that it will work best if you use 22 degrees and if you put your oven in this side of the room versus that side. That's the know-how. That's the knowledge that's not in the patent. Because patents uh, in America, uh, as well as m many other countries, you just have to show one way that this can be done. It doesn't say it has to be the best way.
but the best way is in your minds, in the researcher's mind. So because of that, the transfer of knowledge is best accomplished when people who are actually worked on that technology are involved somehow in the process of commercialization. So, and then inventors are normally very passionate. When you have an idea, you're passionate about it. I invented this water bottle. I'm very, pa I, I, I like it. I want this to be successful. Because of these reasons, spin-outs are a very good way to create this, uh, this bridge from your idea, from the knowledge that's created in the university into something practical that's useful for people. Um, but they're not, but, but they, they, the one thing that they may not have is access to all of the other, um, you know, uh, other skills that are needed for, to go from idea to market access. You need engineering, you're good engineers, you're good scientists, but you also need some design, some market knowledge, you need manufacturing, you need quality assurance. Um, I came from a um, semiconductor uh, you know, background. Um, I had a company uh, which is started by one of my extremely, extremely, I mean, he's like a genius person. Uh, uh, my, my PIs, uh, my, my, my uh, professors, one of the faculty, extremely smart. Uh, and his, his uh, technology is in gallium nitrate, is in it's, it's some kind of a uh, transistors, a new kind of material for transistors. So uh, he, we were talking about, uh, he wanted to get a license to start a startup, and uh, he was showing me the milestones. And I said, you are way off. Uh, you know, you're showing that you will have a product in three years, and that's in semiconductors, you can't have it. It's like not happening. And then we went through it, and one of the processes, for example, in semiconductor is the process of qualification and characterization. And the process can take anywhere from six months to 18 months, even for the intels of the world, because you basically have to have, um, to, to create a whole bunch of products and put them in the oven and, you know, put them in under pressure and try to break them. So he wasn't accounting for that. As smart as he was, he wasn't from the industry, you know. He had seen the semiconductors from standpoint of a professor, from standpoint of a researcher, but not from the practical, uh, you know, if you want to make zillions and zillions of the same thing, you have to have a process in place that assures that uh, the million and uh, fifth is still good, you know. Two million, ten million, they're all still good. Uh, so. These are the things that you may not have as a spin out, and sometimes, um, you know, getting that know how from outside and from talking to people and from talking to industry, that's what uh, will make your life uh, accelerate your, your, the process of innovation and getting to market. So, uh, the most important thing uh, about a business if you have a customer, you have a business. Uh, it's different from, uh, from, from, from just the technology because in technology, if it's a good technology, you print it out, you, you publish it in a journal, and you're golden. In a business, what you need is not a paper, but it's a customer. And this customer, that your technology will satisfy his or her needs for whatever it is that they need to do, um, is, is the one who will determine how big is the market, what pricing you can put on this, what is the ecosystem that you need to get through, uh, and so on and, and so forth. So for you, the first thing that, that, you know, if you're interested in starting a business, is to find a customer, and, and at least a customer, identify a cu customer. Who can use this technology and why would they use it? Um, that's the most important question that as a, you know, spin out has to, uh, answer, you know. Um, it's not important. I mean, all of you guys are smart. You guys, your technology is good. But how the technology work is not important than what the technology does. So the first question is that what the technology does and who it can add value to. Um, you know, I had a, a good talk with some of your colleagues and they, I was very happy to see that they actually have a customer. That's wonderful. 
it's, it's, they know that this technology can make life easy for X, Y, and Z. It's used for something. Um, so that's the first questions that, that, they, they, that, because that will make that dance towards uh, satisfying the needs of this customer uh, easier and make it possible. If you know what, you, what the customer is going to use this for, you are one step closer to the market. And if you know, if, and, and once you know who is going to be using it and why, then you know how many of those people are out there. So that's your market size. Um, if there are only two people in the world who can use this um, uh, technology, then maybe it's not worth um, spending the time and effort to, uh, to create an impact for those two people. Maybe those two people are important, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, something that you need to think about it. Um, so it also will tell you what, who is this, once you know the customer, if you know the customer is a pharmaceutical company. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was talking to a researcher who had a technology that would expedite uh, identifying drug targets or identifying additional drug targets. Okay, so his or her um, target is a pharmaceutical. Then you can understand how many pharmaceutical companies are in the world. Uh, you can understand what is the decision processes for this, what is the ecosystem. So you can, you can understand a lot about uh, how you can approach this market and how you can, uh, you know, uh, whether or not even go into this business. Maybe, if, as I said, if there are two customers and none of them can pay, then, you know, you're not going to make any money. I mean, maybe you can make some other impact. But, but that's, that's the most important thing for, for a uh, spin-out to know. Uh, some, because of the, because there's a, you know, uh, uh, as, as, a, as a person who does a lot of uh, uh, evaluation of technology, I see this, uh, that a lot of uh, startups, a lot of spin-outs, um, they emphasize on the largeness of the market. I just said, okay, well, if there are two people, it's not worth to do it. But if somebody comes and says as a, as a spin-out that I'm going to go after all of the smartphone markets in the world, millions and millions, I would be suspicious. Why? Because, again, understanding who your customer is is very important. And if there are 300 million you know, smartphones in the world being sold, understanding the needs of 300 million people is very difficult. So it's much better to start with a smaller market that you can understand the needs of its customers, especially for spin-outs. Uh, so understanding your customer is important. Understanding the, the um, size of the market and going after the one that's not too big, not too small, just the perfect size is also very important uh, for the success of the spin-out. So now, um, any questions, comments? OK. Let me tell you some stories about some of the spin-outs that um, I have seen. Uh, this, is, this is a very interesting case because there was one set of technologies that uh, we um, licensed to two different companies, two different startups, two different spin-outs. Each of them had a co-exclusive on a set of patents, set of technologies. Um, both companies started with two co-founders each. And one of the two was a technical person, and the other was a business person. Um, so so it, it's, it's a perfect control situation. One company and another company, very similar structure, very similar beginning. One of the two companies decided that, um, first of all, they don't want to get a lot of VC money. Uh, they just want to get enough VC money to get by, but no more than that. So they didn't, even though they are both in electronics, they, they basically needed um, the same amount of money. One of them said, okay, let me get a little bit of a money from a venture capitalist, but then make a product for a very niche market that can bring in some revenue. And also in this process, what they did, what they learned was that they, they're partnered, uh, there was a very large electronic company that was their partner, that that company also can give them some money. So the strategic partner gave them money, 
they didn't take a lot of equity. They didn't have any, um, you know, any say in how the company was run. Uh, and these two people happened to, to be very, very uh, successful. They kept both co-founders. Co the other thing was that they stayed close with their PI who was uh, still in the university. And one of the things that that ha did was that we, they later on licensed some more technology. So they started with, I don't know, a set of six patents. Uh, and then the PI did something um, new and exciting, and they licensed that one and brought it into the company as well. And they did a um, whole bunch of new technologies and things like that. So they are very successful. In fact, they are going to have an IPO, uh, hopefully this um, the beginning of next year. Uh, they are selling products. The same, I'm not going to name them, but their products are very... Um, the customers love them. They're good, good products, and there will be many, many millions of them, uh, hopefully, at some point. Uh, the second company started again with the same, um, the same technology, exact same technology, exact two. This one decided that the one, actually the co-founder of this uh, was a lady that I know about. She was from Sloan School also as well, very smart lady. And, but she had the, this idea that she wants to get a lot of VC money all up front. So she went out and she was very successful in getting millions of dollars, I don't know, 10 million. It was actually one of the largest um, Series A's that um, did. So uh, over the years, they got a lot of money from VCs. But rather than having the discipline of the first company and make a product that's good for their 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 they weren't anxious in getting the product to the market. They had the money, so they might as well just uh, perfect this one and perfect this one and never actually go to market. What happened was that after a while, VCs got tired and they decided that, oh, this, uh, maybe this uh, um, set of uh, management is not good. Um, and uh, so they decided to get rid of the founders. Um, so they brought in different people. The company is floundering, so very soon they will be closing down. And uh, so it means, so, so for me, it shows very well that the focus of the first one, staying in touch with their PI as an advisor, as, an, as a technical advisor, that allowed them to bring in some more uh, technology, allowed them to get some advice from somebody who had been around, was very crucial in their success. The second company didn't have any of them, had tons of money. Um, they, uh, they raised $11 million in one round and another five and another. So they raised a lot of money uh, and they just didn't, didn't do anything. So raising a lot of money is not key. What's key is having a customer, having hopefully more than one customer, but at least one. Exactly. You have a client, you have a business. That's it. So, so have that in mind. N never, you know, uh, so. Uh, second company, uh, again, you know, this was, a, uh, this was in semiconductor photonics, a so silicon photonic area. They, um, they licensed a whole bunch of patents, a whole, too many, um, and which kind of they thought that, okay, but, but the most important patent in the portfolio was actually the one that was furthest away from uh, from uh, from be becoming, uh, you know, it was too early. It was an emerging technology, um, not tested, too, still very much in the science uh, arena, I would say. Science arena, maybe technology arena. Um, the, the licensing officer was a little too uh, anxious in letting them have the patent. So they took the patent, they took the other patents, and then the other patents wasn't very... You know, they basically started, so, so this one was too far away, so they have to spend millions of dollars to get to a, a viable product. And meanwhile, they started working on another product that uh, would give them some money to get them going. Uh, the upshot was that the professor uh, and other professors, you know, because technology is global, you know, if, if you invent something, there's chances that somebody in... I don't know, Belgium or America or China can also, uh, be, is working on the same technology or the same set of technologies. So what happened was that 
they didn't have enough uh, person power to develop that very early stage technology. Others caught up. So they had a breakthrough product before these people can even get to the market. So their, their, their best patent, their best technology was obsolete by the time they get to market. And, uh, you know, so they're still around. Again, these are all walking dead. They haven't dead. They're not dead yet. But this, these people also, you know, uh, raised like $100 million, uh, but, uh, you know, still uh, very much uh, uh, is in the science uh, arena versus a technology arena versus a product arena. So, again, when the technology is too early, the university, us, we have to have the discipline of saying, well, we'll patent it because it's very important. It's a blocking. It's, uh, it's going to have global impact. But let's, you know, let's not license it until the professor, you know, has done another, you know, another patent and they created a, you know, uh, further along. Because a small spin-out company really doesn't have the, um, the resources to get um, something, you know, something to take it all the way out of the, the lab, which is, you know, it's, you know, it's too early for a spin out. So, so there is su such a thing as too early. Um, if it, you know, that's, that's the decision that difficult for TLO to make, but sometimes we have to make because we say, oh, you don't have the resources to take this technology to the market. And resources, remember, resources is, is not dollars. This company had 100 and plus million dollar funding, but they didn't have the, um, um, the researchers, they didn't have the uh, engineers to make this thing work. They just couldn't get their hands on the right people because the right people were working, I don't know, for Berkeley or M MIT or whatever it is. But uh, so, so that's another um, pitfall, if you will, to, to avoid, uh, to, to if the technology is too early, if it's not, um, you know, if it's not ready for the showtime. So this is another um, spin-out. I love this spin-out because, first of all, you know, since 90% uh, of them failed, you can always have some good examples about the ones that didn't make it. Uh, so the ones that make it, oh, everybody knows about it. You know, everybody knows that Google was a spin-out of Stanford. But what's important is to, uh, talk about some of these failures. And the reason that I want to talk about the failures is a couple of things. One is that you learn more from the failure than from success. Um, second is that um, if you don't fail in the um, spin-out world, in the entrepreneurial world, then you don't learn and you don't succeed later. It's, you know, it's part and parcel of being an entrepreneur is uh, accepting that you might fail, that you can fail, because then you can try something new. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know, it, it happens. Um, so this one, this was a platform technology without a particularly good um, application. So the application is, is, is clear. So basically they had a coding that you put inside of a tube, and this, you know that your, your toothpaste, when you get to the end of it, it's very hard to get it out? Or your um, mustard uh, or ketchup uh, bottle? So this technology is a coating that if you put it inside of your tube or bottle or whatever, it allows you uh, to, get, uh, to get all of it out. On the surface of it, it's very interesting. The problem is that the value proposition isn't there. People are not going to pay you to get that last drop of toothpaste. You know, who cares? You know, all right, it's a toothpaste. It's a, it's a uh, ketchup. It's not, um, a, a, you know, it's not a very um, expensive uh, whatever. It's yes, yes. So. The, the, the value proposition wasn't there. People were not willing to pay uh, for this technology. That's number one. The other problem is that who do you sell it to? Do you sell it to the people who make bottles? You sell it to the people who will be uh, 
filling it up with something? You know, would you sell it to a, a ketchup company, for example, or a shampoo company? It's the, the business model, the revenue model was all convoluted. Multiple, multiple applications, um, but none of them really something that people are willing to pay enough to justify the manufacturing because look we, you know you want to put this coating on a bottle bottles are worth what you know like a few cents you know they're they're, they're cheap they uh, and making them more expensive the end customer will not pay for it so the bottle companies didn't want to uh, adopt this technology because they couldn't get their customers pay for it um, so and the end customer uh, was saying look um, if I license it from you uh, and let's say that I am, let's say that I am, uh, I don't know, Heinz Ketchup. Uh, who is a big ketchup manufacturer in, 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 uh, in Spain? Who, who makes mustard in Spain? Heinz, okay, okay. So if Heinz said, okay, fine, I can license it from you, but how can I make my bottler not to sell it for nothing to, to the next guy? So I pay for the technology, you know, I cannot make the bottler not see what's going on and not use this. So the enforcement of their license became a problem. So lack of a good um, business revenue model for them, that was another problem. Again, it's still around, but, but I don't know. Uh, another walking dead, this one, uh, with a quantum dot technology. It, it, it turned out that the quantum dots are very hard to manufacture. I'm not a chemist, so you know, those of you here might, might know better. And it, they're very unstable. So this company uh, decided that they have a way of dealing with that 10 years ago. Um, and in the beginning, uh, the company actually made a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, publicity, it was in Boston Globe, uh, you know, Samsung was interested, LG was interested. Uh, again, they raised a lot of money, which is the reason that's, this is the reason that they're still around. But they never solved the manufacturing problem. And um, it's not clear to anybody uh, if they can ever solve that. And meanwhile, um, other technologies came along and uh, you know, they, uh, they basically got the market share. So, you know, again, money, I know that it's very hard to say, but money is cheap when it comes to, to entrepreneurship and spin out. What is not cheap is your time and effort and life. And, um, you know, uh, most of us uh, graduate with a PhD in our late 20s or early 30s. And if you want to go to the entrepreneurial world and uh, spend the next 10 years on something that is not going to create an impact, that's a very expensive price to pay. Um, so it's good to, to know what can fail so you have a way of avoiding that. So what is the, what is the lessons that we learned? Well, we have to have a customer. You have to have a customer, identifying application and customer. Realistic estimation of time to market. If, you know, just saying it's going to take three years is not, you know, remember again, this is not the amount of money, this is your life. So it's important to understand, okay, is it really 10 years? If it's a 10 years, is it something that nobody else will catch up to you by the time you get there? Um, or is it better to leave it in the, uh, in the university and just work with it? Uh, it's important to get inventors all involved because, as I said, they have a knowledge that a licensee will not have. And, of course, last but certainly not least is focus, focus, focus. So these are the lessons that we have learned uh, looking at some of our less successful spin-outs. Uh, again, these are some of the things that, um, that had been shown to maybe help incubator, accelerator, anything that give the entrepreneur some help in terms of 
not only money, but in terms of mentorship, in terms of um, input, in terms of being a sounding board, uh, those can help uh, the, um, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to make this uh, more of a success uh, and sooner. Um, some of the programs that we have at MIT, I just listed them. Uh, VMS is mentoring. The Shpandi is a mentoring plus a little bit of a money. Sandbox is smaller amount of money and also mentoring. 100K is a, a, gra is a prize, you know, so uh, is a business plan prize. Um, and then, you know, there's some other uh, parts of ecosystem that, again, most of them are there to help the entrepreneur find their way. If there's some money involved, it's a small. Uh, again, because, you know, if your idea is great and you have a good market and everything, at least in America, a lot of VCs, they, you know, seek you out and, and uh, are willing to, to give you money. Um, the key is to get only the money that you need and no more. Um, and with that, um, um, I have something about, uh, I don't know, do I have time or shall I? Um, you know, just a little bit, the innovation grants, there's a small amount of money. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, those help, you know, $100,000. There are a couple of them around MIT, MIT EI, and Deshpande. Um, they basically, again, allow the young company to do something, to do some maybe test, to put together a proof of concept. Um, and, um, you know, the money is not too big. Uh, allows people to freedom to innovate. If, if you lose $100,000, it's not that important. But if you lose $10 million, then the VC will not be happy. So these, uh, these grants can, um, you know, can, can provide uh, some ability to do risk taking, some ability to do dialogue, mentorship, and uh, that all helps the, the, young, um, the young company. So, uh, this is becoming very, um, it's, an, it's a relatively effective, relatively cheap program to have, and this is becoming uh, more and more, um, uh, you know, uh, used in America still. I don't know about others. Uh, collaboration with bigger companies sometimes is very useful. Not always the, uh, the uh, silver bullet. Uh, big companies can bring um, help in areas where, I mean, small companies don't know much about sales, support, logistics, uh, big companies does, so uh, big, big companies do, so, uh, you know, sometimes that's a help uh, that uh, this collaboration and partnership can bring. So that's another potentially uh, useful um, tool that universities can facilitate. Um, so, uh, if you are going for any of these collaborations or innovation grant, it's important to have um, an idea of where you go afterwards. So let's say that you prove that this bottle can be made with $100,000, or if you work with, uh, I don't know, a big company in Spain and, and get to that proof of concept, it's important to know what is next. Um, are you going to go and, if it's you're successful, are you going to go and get VC money? Are you going to bring it back to the university. So that's uh, something that you, you, you may want to have in mind to continue to realize value. Um, so these are the some of things, again, the same thing. I just said that before. Some of the things that university can help with, you know, mentorship, uh, early seed fu funding through innovation grants, some training, guidance, and entrepreneurship. Uh, about markets, customers, things like that, uh, and of course, facilitating partnership. So with that, I'm going to thank you and uh, open for questions. Thank you. All right, any questions, please? Yes? Do you give some kind of support to the companies uh, once they have been founded or after uh, you work with the researchers and uh, make all the business plan and found the company, 
You don't follow them? Well, the, as, as technology licensing office, no. Uh, technology, but MIT ecosystem, as I said, there are multiple organizations where they can help with that. Uh, you know, Venture Mentoring Service, for example, helps with the mentoring. Uh, there's Martin Trust Center, which I didn't put there. Martin Trust Center can help you match, for example, scientists with people from Sloan School. So you can have a business plan, you know, working with them to come out. But, but because um, our ecosystem is rich, um, you know, we have incubators, um, you know, Cambridge in Incubation Center just across the street. So uh, we don't really have to um, invest um, in, in those. And certainly TLO is, is very narrowly focused on licensing and, and patenting. Any other questions? But if, if you are in a situation where that, that ecosystem doesn't exist, then it makes sense for, for university. Yes, question. Where can university help? Mm, from your point of view, mm -hmm. what is m more important? Because all of them are mm, different. Okay, so, so, so if, you, if yeah. you need yeah. to choose one of them, one or two of these blocks. Well, I think knowledge, you know, either a combination of mentoring and training. And, um, you know, there is a certain, I mean, it's, um, it, if, if, if you train your entrepreneurs, you know, this is customer, you know, what to look for, what's an application, what is, you know, uh, within the maybe a, a short sort of workshop of a week or so, you have, you gain so much knowledge about the markets and, you know, everything else, and, and, and then you can do your, and then the second one will be the mentoring, because again, if, 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 we, if you can, recognized your own bad ideas, you can save so much time and money that you don't need the innovation grant or whatever. So if, if I were to just do one, that would be the training and guidance. And then second would be the mentoring. So these two are the most important, in my mind, uh, of, of all of them. And innovation awards are only effective when it is combined with any of them. And, yeah. you know, for example, again, more and more uh, innovation grants that are that we provide them that the MIT provides come with either mentoring or with training and mentoring. So uh, it's that's just you know it it saves so much time, so much effort, so much uh, failure. Uh, that's you know that's. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, well, this all the, this late uh, past years, we've been focusing a lot of on the spin-offs and starting our companies and so on. But as an education uh, yeah, institution, we also see that uh, what would be a good percentage of people that would go on to found their own company, and people who would uh, go to work for other companies. For no, no, not everybody can start their own company, and mm -hmm. those companies need people to work. Correct. Uh, well, uh, so, what would be for a higher uh, education institution a, a good? Well, I think that there are two things. One is that if you do even like a, one of the ideas behind Sandbox is that you don't need to end up being, and I, I have worked with a lot of big companies. And within a big company, if you know how to form your ideas, how to sell your ideas, how to be an entrepreneur inside a company, and to innovate and commercialize within the big company, that's a very valuable skill. And people like myself, even I, when I, after I come back out of the MBA program, I learned that by doing. So if I had done, uh, if I had learned, even after, even if th you decide that entrepreneurship is not for you, it's okay. You have, still have learned. It's very important to, uh, as an engineer, as a scientist, let's say that you work for DuPont, 
if you know where your technology might go, you don't just invent. You invent with the intention of making something out of that. And for corporations, that's very valuable. That's part of innovation um, ecosystem. It, that's a sustainability. So to me, it's not a number. So uh, you know, it's, it's the, the fact that you are involved in that activity and you learn and you work with others because entrepreneurship is not a, a lonely game. It's you have to have a team. You learn how to work with people. So the skills that you learn isn't, can help you in the corporate world. So I think that, I think it's just a personal opinion, that whatever we do, the, you know, putting emphasis on spin out is good because that's one way to get the technology out. But as an educational tool, again, being involved in some entrepreneurship with another team is important because there are <coughs> skills that you don't learn in the classroom, but you learn from doing this project. And that's the whole, as I said, idea behind, you know, uh, giving people small grants and say, okay, well, go try this. Okay, I have an, you have an idea, wonderful. This is a little bit of a money, not too much. Uh, you can form a team, you can work with them, you can try to hit a milestone. It works, it works. It doesn't work, doesn't work. It's a, you know so so that's the whole idea, is that the, is that clear? So one hundred percent of entrepreneurs, some of them working at so the public yes. some of them working in large companies, and some of them uh, creating yeah. their own companies. But one hundred percent. Yes, exactly. Entrepreneurs work in everywhere here, yeah. so you can be an entrepreneur as a civil servant. Exactly, sure. exactly. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I come from the, the department in front of, it, of this one, um, uh, CICUS. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm, doing a material science uh, PhD mm, study at yes. the moment. Yes. And uh, I come from another field uh, of applied sciences for cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. So uh, what if uh, your field uh, and your impact cannot be measured in terms of dollars and also in terms of commercializing ideas because the, the final user is not um, um, an industry or a sure, technology? Sure, sure. What happens? Well, I mean, uh, it's... Um, it's true that, uh, you know, uh, we can't, not everything has a commercial, uh, immediate commercial impact. Uh, yeah. You look at, you know, people who discovered uh, um, insulin, uh, the, the effect of insulin in regulating blood sugar or in diabetes or whatever. The, the be in the beginning, it's the discovery. It's, the, it's the, you know, you discover something, you, you know, test it, whatever. And you don't even know whether or not it will be ever used for something. And there's certainly value in that. Um, as a matter of practicality for the university, they have to have a balance because, you know, uh, again, more and more uh, the, the funding becomes uh, problematic for universities for research because both the government say, okay, where is my return on investment? I invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the universities in United States, and I'm getting nothing in return in terms of creating jobs and economic activities. Um, you know, so, so there is a pressure to do that. But I think that it's um, short-sighted if all of the universities become applied sciences and technology. So you have to have uh, a balance, a good balance. And I, it's, it's different for every field, it's different for, for every university. But you need those thinkers who think without, without having any kind of a um, application in mind because those, you know, yeah. those, those, those are valuable as well. But the problem is that I'm an applied scientist and my whole like, uh, university path and also professional path before starting this PhD program 
was in apply in in the field, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, I was trained not as a chemist or as a physicist, not even as an engineer, mm -hmm. but as a scientist applied to cultural heritage. Sure. So. I have to find out applications that are somehow for cultural heritage. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the. I mean, I. I. I'm a scientist by training, but I'm also. But um, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, especially in social s sciences, you need to understand the the history. Yeah. If you don't understand the history, you can't have um, science and uh, policy. You don't. Ha you can't have policies, uh, because the policies because. You can't experiment on everything, especially socially, but it has been done before. So if you know your history, you can help uh, form policies in yeah. different fields. Um, so those are, uh, you know, that's the application. It's not just, uh, you know, knowing that who was in, uh, uh, I don't know, who won what war in whatever, whatever year. It's also understanding the cause and effect. Mm -hmm. and have an analytical scientific uh, view of those historical or cultural events and how you can um, apply that to to create economic impact for example well uh, we deal with conservation of yes. materials so yes. that's the more practical uh, sure, sure. impact then on sure. the material itself mm -hmm. and uh, the thing is that I have a lot of difficulties in talking to my colleagues from the scientific side and also from my colleagues in the on the area of social sciences sciences and art and art history or conservation itself mm -hmm. so i should be the person that has a view like like a bridge a bridge mm -hmm. and I, it's very hard <laughs> it is hard it's <laughs> always hard to be a bridge uh, yeah it's a uh, you know i think that you have to step up and uh, see what of the two um I mean, I, I'll give you an example for myself. Um, I, I, as I said, I trained as a, sci as a scientist, as a technologist, so if you get a PhD in mechanical engineering. And then later on, I became a product manager for, I don't know, for some semiconductor part. Um, one of the things is that as a trained engineer, you understand the whatever constraints there are in design. So in, in some sense, you can guide the, the engineer. However, I always made myself not to do that. I understood why he's making whatever decisions he or she is making and questioned that. But I never designed it for him or her because I'm not, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, managing a process is different from doing the same process. You, you have to let people the freedom to do that. So, if I were, you know, uh, to, to, to act as a bridge, sometimes, uh, sometimes it helps to have an application or a customer in mind, if, even though this application and this customer may not be a paying customer, but maybe, maybe your customer is Museums. a museum. And then you can, you can look at both. Okay, so why is it that the museum needs to do this from the standpoint of, you know, technology and what can be done to do this? So your customer, it's an impact. You, you are creating an impact. So customer is a museum. Um, and you want to convince them that they need to conserve, to use this material to, to do the conservation. It's very powerful when you know the context uh, and the importance and the value of that to the museum because you have been in that world. So, you know, think about your customer. Have everything customer oriented. Uh, and Thank then, you, you know. Hopefully that will help. Questions, comments? Yes, please. Yes, I would like to know something about the MIT's policy about uh, spin-offs, and particularly uh, when a, uh, a new spin-off is created. What part of this spin-off belongs to the MIT? Well, normally, if the spin-off doesn't use any MIT IP, then, you know, not. It's just so it's, a, it's you know, um, people, f I mean, there was a Kaufman uh, um, uh, study that showed MIT created, I don't know, millions, zillions and zillions. More than 25,000. More, more than 25,000 yeah. um, companies. So, yeah. so not, except that um, people 
donates to MIT, creates. But if, uh, in, as, if as part of the spin-off, they're going to do a licensing deal, um, like, you know, I, I made some six licensing deals with six startups, six spin out of the, uh, MIT. Part of licensing, depending on the situation, can be um, in small equity uh, uh, MIT in the company, some, some two to five percent um, of, of, uh, of the company. Two at to five percent. At the time of IPO. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, because anything more than that, VCs start getting really antsy. VCs like MIT's investment because, uh, let's say that the startup, uh, you know, was very optimistic and they uh, agreed to certain uh, licensing terms that was not realistic. Uh, and let's say as a TLO, I wasn't smart enough or I wasn't, you know, a market change or whatever. Um, if MIT has an incentive to see the company succeed, uh, which the 2% or 5% will do, um, MIT has an incentive to renegotiate the license. And we do that all the time, you know. Um, you know, three years down the road, the company hasn't met its milestones, but they think another two years, we renegotiate on that. You know, royalty rate is too high. When we can negotiate, renegotiate on that. But that small percentage would give us an incentive to do that, as small as it could be. Uh, but, uh, you know, and VCs like that. Mm -hmm. um, I had a spin out that was uh, sold to a much bigger company just, uh, just in the, the end of the summer. And it provided a, a nice little, you know, check for MIT. Nobody became super rich, but it was a nice, you know, nice little um, check. So it was a gravy. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.